Der Rächer von Professor Arno Brecher. Eternal life, the eternal recurrence of life, the future promised and hallowed in the past, the triumphant yea to life despite death and change, real life conceived as the collective prolongation of life through procreation, through the mysteries of sexuality. The art should be the bridge between nature and civilization. It should be what connects civilization to nature, and what is nature but not war, and what is beauty but not the aesthetic of war. The Greek aesthetic of beauty is always tied to warfare, these great, strong, lean bodies which are used to defeat your enemies in battle. Beauty is the armor of, of warfare and violence. Salwete, legionaries, I am joined by an honored guest, the Ark. Here today, he has come all the way from the planet of Mars on a chariot flown by cyborg horses because we live in this futurist age. And unfortunately, uh, the pegasi of old cannot withstand the atmospheric pressure of the great expanse of space beyond Earth. So on his great chariot, he has made his way to my estate, but currently we are social distancing and he is in the other side of my mansion. Welcome, Arik. How are you doing today? Hello. Yes, I come to bring the religion of the future. But don't worry, I am triple masked. Uh, and, you know, I hear they have uh, some interesting things going on on this planet. And, you know, I wouldn't want to bring any anything back to Mars. So I have uh, triple masks on and I'm actually wrapped in a styrofoam and um, plastic as well, tape over my mouth, so we should be safe. Good, good, and just make sure you don't come any closer to me, because I can almost, I can almost feel the uh, the potential diseases that might be exchanged. We take we take health very seriously in my estate, but all that aside, the conversation we'd like to discuss today is essentially what will it take to enact a cultural renaissance in such a faded, disgusting bug life modernity, and I think. One place I'd like to start is analyzing the state of art today and how degraded it has become from the past. So when I look at music, for example, today, who's the most popular female artist today? It's Taylor Swift. And I think the fact that somebody like Taylor Swift is the most popular artist today sort of shows you how consumption-based and how how much like music has become part of appealing to a wide audience. It doesn't have any real vitalist quality about it. I think when you listen to an orchestra, for instance, whether it's Wagner or you go back further to Bach or whatever, these, these, these orchestras, they invoke a certain spirit within you. Call it a heroic spirit. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but it, there's something very vital about it. It invokes this relationship with nature where you just feel the will to conquer. You see all these, these percussions and strings in harmony together. It's almost like the sounds that you might hear deep in the jungle or deep in the forest. It's this orchestra of life and death, of a, a wild cat tearing apart a, a small deer, but that mixes in with bird song and it mixes in with the sound of rain falling from the trees and it becomes an orchestra of life. But today, music is so bland. It's so substant, substantless. It doesn't have any real quality. It's all about this mid, excuse me, sorry, but Taylor Swift is mid, this mid 35 year old woman who appeals to all these other mid and sometimes sub mid, you know, 30 year old women because they're not threatened by this. They're not threatened by this art. It makes them feel comfortable with their own mediocrity, where I think great art makes you uncomfortable with your position. It makes you want more. It makes you invokes a Faustian will within you to expand. So that's sort of where I'm at with that. I know you come from Mars, so maybe you're not as familiar with Taylor Swift, but I know you also have a nano computer that downloads every hundred years of human culture. So maybe you still have a good take on what's sort of going on right now. 
Well, uh, please do not insult my queen, Taylor Swift. On Mars, she is actually a god, and I am personally devoted to her. I make sacrifices of oil and incense every weekend, so please don't insult her. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think um, you're getting at something which I actually talk about in uh, my most recent video on my channel, uh, which is about to premiere The Cult of Life which is that societies start to decay when their rituals, their values, and their institutions are no longer connected with life and with the basic functions of life. So, you know, in the past, we'd have rituals like animal sacrifice, which is a, a religious ritual, which is making holy the process of butchering and eating an animal. Today, we just have factory farming. We don't think about it. The food just shows up in a store. And so we're disconnected from our food. But the same applies to other things like music, like art. These things would have served functions. You know, myths had meaning. They had practical meaning to them. They weren't just these abstract stories. They had uh, meaning which was connected to life, for example, the myth of Persephone, of course, is intimately connected with the seasons, uh, with death, with rebirth, with agriculture, uh, with the Eleusinian mysteries. So you get at the end of the hymn to Demeter, you get an explanation of the Eleusinian mysteries, uh, just a brief one, because it was, core, uh, of course, secretive, but you get a nod towards these mysteries. So the whole hymn to Demeter, this myth about death, about marriage, about reproduction, agriculture, is then tied to this uh, religious festival, this religious ritual. So everything was tied to the essential drives, the essential instincts, uh, the necessary practices of life, like marriage, uh, the necessary virtues, like courage and war. And when we get to this, I guess you could say, decadent stage in society, we see that everything becomes disconnected from life and and. I guess modern art would be a great example where it's just these shapes which don't mean anything. They don't have a connection to anything. And that's almost the purpose is to make it as disconnected and disconcerting and alienating as possible. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned the aspect of ritual because what is ritual, but not trying to invoke a certain quality onto its listener or the, the witness of the ritual. I think a lot of early music is absolutely is absolutely a recounting of of either founding myths or religion itself and i think the reason for this and why why music begins this way is because obviously with myth what is the point of myth well the point of myth is supposed to get get you to act a certain way aspire to be something so we look at the founding myths of of any successful peoples it's always to invoke this heroic quality by showing you the heroes of the past and by saying you should be like them. So, of course, you have the, the heroes such as Hercules, you have Perseus, you have, with the Iliad, you have, obviously, Homer recounting the, the great feats of, of Achilles, or even anyone else in, within that story. You have the Aeneid, obviously recounting the early history of Rome and the early history of Rome is filled with these great heroes. It's filled with Aeneas himself, Romulus and Remus. And then of course, throughout Roman history, you immortalize all the great people who moved Rome forward, who moved Rome towards higher power. So early music in a lot of ways is just an extension of this mythos because obviously, especially when things were passed down orally, like people don't realize how difficult it must have been to recount the Iliad for, for hundreds of years before it was actually written down. That's why it was in this rhythmic, uh, poetic structure. And of course, uh, the Ark once was once recounted, or not recounted, but once gave us the, the privilege of listening to the first, uh, was the first stanza of the Iliad because you speak a little, a little bit of ancient Greek and that was really cool. And that demonstrates, well, there's this, there's this almost musical quality to how they, they presented it. And I think a lot of early music, 
begins as this almost ritualistic thing, this recounting of heroism, this recounting of an ideal that you want the listener or the witness of this ritual or this song to emulate. So then when we look at modern art, it's it's interesting because, well, what are we trying to emulate anymore? If In the case of Taylor Swift, I get that she's a god in Mars, but I myself as an earthling will have to counter signal the, the great queen of Mars herself, Taylor Swift, because what does she what does she sing about? She sings about breaking, getting broken up with all the time, uh, very petty heartbreak that really doesn't have a lot of substance to it. So what are you what are you passing on to women, for example, through Taylor Swift's music? <laughs> it's uh, you're going to get broken up with. You're going to get your heart broken by a man. You're going to be distrustful of men. That's essentially what she's passing on. Be distrustful of men. If you look at all these sad songs today, obviously there was a uh, video. I think both of us watched by Uber Boyo where he's talking about the sort of sad, depressing, weak, modern uh, sort of, I don't even know what to call it, but just sad, the sad music like you get with uh, Radiohead, for example, uh, which is the example he used. And he's talking about how sad my life is. It's so depressing. I can't do anything. I have no agency. I'm just this sad little thing. So, of course, what does that impart to the listener? It imparts you're this sad little thing with no agency. You have no control of your destiny. Relish and wallow in this sadness. So that's what you're passing on to people. And even with something like rap, which is a little a little bit more vitalistic, because instead of being sad, it's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have sex with with hoes and and make money and run up on the ops. It's also like, well, what does this really contribute culturally? We're gonna have a bunch of barbarous barbaric thugs, which which doesn't really build anything. It's a very sure. It's like you're still sort of in touch with that original violent energy, but there's no structure to it. It's too Dionysian in a way. There is no structure to, well, how do we use this violence? Whereas the songs of the past, it gives you this framework under which you can operate. It's the framework of here is a heroic mythos where there is a specific goal and where these people are fulfilling a specific goal through the heroic ideal, which ends up being beneficial for the collective group which that hero represents. For Achilles, though he has selfish moments, ultimately he is who delivers, not quite he himself, but he contributes to delivering the Greeks' victory. Or Odysseus, for example, with his, with his horse, the Trojan horse. That's the story you tell, is his heroism contributes to the collective effort of, of the Greeks. So... Today, you don't really have that. You don't have any structure to even the vitalist energy. So where do you go from there? So I think that's, that's really pertinent that you bring that up. And I think when we talk about cult- cultural renaissance, we have to think, well, how do we reinvoke the vitalism of the past that does lead people to heroism? And I think you have to do that by having a founding mythos. So for example, of course, Augustus commissions Virgil to write the Aeneid for this exact purpose. And I think re reinvigorating our culture with, with a founding myth, with people who they can aspire to, for example, instead of putting businessmen on pedestals, instead of putting actresses and actors or Taylor Swift's on a pedestal, you have to put people on pedestals that increase the power of the collective group. In Rome, it was the Caesars, it was Romulus, it was Aeneas, it was Marius, it was all these people who made Rome stronger. So I guess the question I have for you, Ark, is how do you think we in this day begin a new cultural renaissance? How do we actually reinvoke the heroic ideal in such a stagnant and consumer-driven culture? Well, I was going to suggest colossal statues of Taylor Swift holding the torch of <laughs> Prometheus in every city but uh, I guess you're not in favor of that. <laughs> but <laughs> I think when you talk about being in context, that is very important because I guess to go back to myth and ritual, in a sense, rituals have a utilitarian purpose, right? Like animal sacrifice uh, ritualizes, again, butchering animals. You might have a marriage ritual. And these are all rituals which are built around the essential needs of life, reproduction, uh, eating. But 
the point of the myth and the point of the ritual is to contextualize them. So we're not, you know, it tells us why we're doing this thing. So with animal sacrifice, it's related to the myth of Prometheus. So it's not just that we're sacrificing an animal and, uh, you know, we're going to say, ah, yes, thank you, nature, for providing us with sustenance or, or something kind of superficial like this. It's connected to this whole theology, this whole worldview. And again, you know, same thing with marriage or uh, the Dionysian mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries. They're all connected with a greater worldview and within a greater context. And I think nihilism to a large extent is lacking that context, feeling like you're out of context, like you're not connected to any greater tradition. And so, as you say, creating that tr tradition or recreating that tradition or even reconnecting with that tradition, because I think it doesn't always have to be a new tradition. A lot of the times, you know, the act of founding can be an almost fabricated history, like with uh, um, Joffrey of Monmouth saying that Brutus founded Britain. Uh, right, Brutus, the uh, grandson, I believe, of Aeneas. So whether that history is fabricated or, you know, it's an invented myth or whether it's a real event, what's really important is that it gives context to the individual so that when they're acting, when they're uh, maybe even doing simple things like eating or when they're just going throughout their daily life, they feel that their action has meaning because it's connected to this broader context. It's connected to this greater worldview. And let me actually pull up a little passage from Nietzsche here, Twilight of the Idols, which I have on hand, where he's talking about the meaning of the Dionysian mysteries. And he, of course, talks about, you know, the things which he always talks about, the will to life, the expression of excessive energy, uh, the making holy of pain in relation to creation, that, you know, in pregnancy you need pain, uh, so you need pain to create life and so on. But towards the end of the passage, he says this interesting thing. He says, quote, what did the Hellene gain for himself with these mysteries? And, you know, referring to the Dionysian mysteries. And uh, I continue the quote, eternal life, the eternal recurrence of life, the future promised and hallowed in the past, the triumphant yea to life despite death and change real life conceived as the collective prolongation of life through procreation, through the mysteries of sexuality, end quote. So I think what's really important there is he's pointing to the idea of life, not as uh, just the life of the individual, but as a prolonged uh, force uh, or, or something, something like this. So through procreation, life is reborn each generation. So it's a, actually a generational project. And in the Dionysian mysteries, you would connect to this kind of greater life force, right? Which is expressed in you, but is also part of this, this great chain. It is also reborn each season like Persephone. And that really puts you in a greater context. And today, you know, when we think of, uh, nihilism like class you know typical nihilistic views that a teenager might have like you know what's the point we all die anyway and so on this conception of life as an intergenerational project uh, actually addresses most of those concerns because then your life is no longer just your individual life in isolation and what you do actually matters because it connects to this broader tradition and it actually you know affects life itself yeah, and that actually makes me. That's gonna. That's kind of brought up a couple of thoughts that I had. I think it's interesting that you bring up the idea of this sort of generational project, which I think ends up, like you say, it ends up being this antidote to nihilism. I think people feel nihilistic because ultimately, especially today, and we we bring up consumer art for example, and you look at Disney, which I think is one of the most influential forms of media for the youth today. You grow up on Disney and what happens in Disney? The princess, without agency of her own, generally, meets the prince and the prince sweeps her off her feet and he's perfect and they live happily ever after. There is no idea of living in the moments of pain 
as also being what brings beauty to life. It's always this like struggle, maybe in the case of they have like a little struggle, obviously Snow White. Oh, she, she, she's been poisoned. She needs to be kissed or Cinderella. Oh, my step sisters and stepmother are so mean to me. And then it's over and then you live happily ever after. But that's, that's not life. So you have all these kids that are brought up thinking there will be a point where the pain stops and you can drop pack and everything will be okay. And that's precisely the ideology, I think, of the left today and why they are so mediocre is that they just accept, they just accept themselves for who they are because they want to quit. They don't want to keep the fight. They don't want to keep marching. They just want to be done. And I think it's the same with what you would describe with nihilism. People grow nihilistic because they're expecting this end. They're expecting this, this thing that's just going to answer all their problems, this meaning, let's say, or this happily ever after. And of course, Nietzsche, especially with his concept of eternal recurrence, is like, well, no, it's precisely the, the process which is so beautiful. In the Hagakure, and I love using this, this quote in relation to, to eternal recurrence, is that you must seek perfection knowing you will never be perfect. Lifelong ambition to be perfect, knowing you will never be perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's about the pursuit of perfection, the struggle, but also the joy of, of milestones on the way. But you're never done. You're never going to reach the peak. And that's the beauty of it. You just keep going. And somehow you reach the peak. You learn how to fly. And you become like Is Icarus. And you go as far as you can to the sun before the wax on your wings is burned off. That's what's beautiful. And I think that I'm actually going to tie this into Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy by Costa and Alamario. I always say the name wrong, so you can correct me, uh, Ark, if, if I said that wrong. But uh, one of the fundamental principle or characteristics of an aristocracy that he points out is that with these pastoral people who are breeding animals, for instance. And they're breeding animals so that those animals can do a better job of feeding them. They can do a better job of, of having a high quality to help these pastoral people live. Because of that, they start to recognize the effects of breeding over time and selective breeding. And they start to observe these animals and they say, hmm, if I put this animal with this animal, it leads to this animal, which is higher quality. So they start to see that in regards to themselves. And they start to see breeding as something which can propel a people forward towards something greater. It's this idea of agency and this idea of, of almost like you say, with, with life is reborn in every generation. So this aristocratic mindset is directly tied to the idea of breeding stronger people over time, to having this eugenic outcome where we are going to create these these higher types of people over time. And I think this exactly, strangely enough, connects to what we're talking about with cultural renaissance and the stagnancy of modern consumer art because modern consumer art, it's very much about dropping pack. It's like, be happy with who you are. You're a unique little snowflake. Who you are is perfect. It's this idea that you don't have to keep working towards anything. So of course, people aren't having kids today. Fertility rates globally, except for a few continents where they don't have this mindset yet, globally, fertility rates are so low because people don't care about the future anymore. They care about dropping pack in this generation and being quote unquote complete. In Fight Club, the, the, the narrator wants to be complete. He wants to complete his condominium with the perfect dining set, with all the perfect plates or not even perfect plates, but just having the, the right amount of plates. Uh, he wants to have the perfect wardrobe, complete, complete wardrobe. They want to be complete so that they can quit. So of course they're not having kids because having kids is all about this idea that you're going to create an offspring that is even greater than you. No real man in history wanted their children to be lesser than them. True men want their children to be even greater, to go even further. This is, the, this is the exact idea of aristocracy is that your legacy, your family name becomes greater than just yourself. And I think that this is sort of what uh, Costin is pointing to in selective breeding. And it's almost this idea of futurism in a way, because what is futurism but not moving forward, moving towards something greater? And I think that what you say is it hits the nail on the head with life is reborn in every generation. And this is true of art now. This is true of art because this art is telling us 
to just be who we are and never aspire to something more. So people aren't having kids. People aren't aspiring to conquer. The Faustian ambition is being dulled and dimmed. And like it's it's literally the agents of modernity are throwing a bucket of water on our Faustian ambitions, our Promethean ambitions. The Promethean torch is being doused with water. Because, of course, as an economic elite, it's a lot easier to just have mindless consumers that eat more and more slop, that buy more and more shit they don't need. It's in Fight Club again, right? He's like, advertising has us uh, chasing... Well, I'll pull up the exact quote just for just for uh, the actual... Uh, just to be authentic, right? He says, uh, advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. This is exactly the issue with modern art and with this idea of dropping pack, with this idea of giving up, with this idea of being complete. Never be complete. He says that in Fight Club too. He says, I say never be complete. Self-improvement is masturbation. So all this stuff is brilliant. And I'm sure the, the writer, uh, Chuck Palinchuk, or whatever the hell you say his name, probably read a lot of Nietzsche to, to come to the, these conclusions. Life is an eternal recurrence while you are living. You are never complete. But then through through uh, your children, it's almost like a rebirth. You create a better version of yourself. Philip II raised Alexander to be this great conquering prince. And of course, though Philip himself planned the Persian campaigns, he died before he could actually undergo that campaign. But then Alexander does it. And Alexander, despite the fact that Philip II is already so great in his own right, Alexander dwarfs him in comparison. And that's the beauty of it. And art is the same way. When we create art with invoking this idea of, of the future, with invoking this idea of something greater than yourself, then people are willing to do more, to be more, so that the future can be more. That's essentially, I think, the, the issue here. And consumer art is just drop pack, buy your slop now, and be satisfied. So I went on a bit of a rant, so I'll pass it back to you, Ark. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think I want to quote one of Taylor Swift's songs here. <laughs> It goes, uh, what is good? All that heightens the feeling of power in man, the will to power, power itself. Oh, wait a minute. This might be the wrong text. Okay, never mind. But um, I think what you're getting at ties in with uh, the, hero the heroic, uh, or rather the tragic worldview, which we've discussed uh, before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually interesting because maybe Taylor Swift's songs kind of fall into the tragic worldview right no happy endings but uh in <laughs> in greek mythology there are very few happy endings and in disney i think the idea of the happy ending might come from arthurian romance because even though those tales are modeled off of Grimm's tales they have a kind of chivalric ethos uh, the virtues and and even the aesthetics seem kind of pulled from Arthurian romance. But even in Arthurian romance, there are a few happy endings. There are, uh, there are some, but the tragic worldview, of course, then posits that there can be no ends, as you say, no end state. And Nietzsche talks about this. Um, so there can be no u utopia. And if that's the case, then you have to strive for greatness, for peaks. And Nietzsche also talks about this, peaks and valleys, right? So the hero is at his greatest, usually at the peak of his life. And then there's, you know, a downfall, right? He usually doesn't have a happy ending, whether it's Hercules, you know, Hercules proves himself as a hero, but then in, cursed by Hera with madness, he murders his family, uh, you know, so then there's a down going and then he embarks on these labors and becomes a great hero again. And eventually he is unknowingly poisoned by his wife and uh, jumps into his own funeral pyre. And uh, then he does achieve godhood, which could be kind of an ascent, but there is no happiness. It's these peaks and valleys where greatness is achieved for a moment, uh, you know, only to again uh, give way to tragedy. And, this worldview, of course, is, is completely counter to Christianity and, and leftism and anything which posits any kind of utopia. And it instead posits that we can overcome man, we can overcome our certain, our, our um, 
you know, our condition, but it has to be done through these spurts of effort. Right. And, uh, you know, almost, it's almost tied into the spirit of athleticism, right? The, the athlete gives a performance and that's the peak of his career. There's no end state, but you know, the, the best fruit of his life might be this one performance or this one feat, which he achieved. So, you know, that's a major reframe from basically any way which we think in modernity. Basically, we think almost entirely in terms of progressivism. And I'm not sure how we could have a large scale reframe. Of course, I'm interested in bringing back this classical view, this pagan view of virtue and of life and the whole theology, which is connected with it. But the question of how that could be brought back to the average person when the average person very much thinks in terms of material achievement, in terms of material betterment, uh, you know, societal betterment, betterment, increased equality. Even I made a video recently about the manosphere. Even the manosphere works in this way where they posit this kind of heaven, right? You <laughs> in your nice car, you have your flat, you have all these women, you have your perfect body. It's about achieving this end state. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely tough to think about how, you know, concretely we could change people's outlook and maybe it just has to happen organically maybe you can't really force it but obviously at the beginning of civilizations you have this barbaric spirit people are intimately connected with the essential aspects of life they're intimately connected with nature they understand how nature works uh, you know the pressures of necessity are forcing them to behave in certain ways uh, you know you you can't really indulge in delusions and moral delusions and things like this. But at the stage where we are now, if we want to get back to that state, it kind of has to be done consciously because, you know, eventually there will be some kind of collapse, the more and more disconnected we become from nature. But at the moment, people can have moral delusions and, you know, delusions about life. People don't have to think about where their food is coming from. People don't have to think about how nature functions. People, for the most part, don't even have to think about death. And, so if we want to revitalize our society, we would have to do that consciously. We'd have to consciously engage with these things and then consciously put in place rituals which engage with these things and which are connected, as we were speaking earlier, to a broader tradi tradition, to myths and so on. And that's the tough part. Yeah. And I think there's two things I want to harp on based on what you said. So you say sometimes the maybe perhaps the collapse must happen organically. And I think this is largely the sort of uh, idea that you get with, for example, accelerationism. I'm not necessarily saying <laughs> we should be accelerationist because some of them are batshit crazy and they essentially want to vote or contribute to whatever leads to complete collapse. But that, it's this idea that out of the ashes, only out of the ashes, you can recreate things. So I want to explore this concept a little bit without endorsing it because it is interesting. Because right now we live in an artificial life without warfare, without struggle, without killing our animals ourselves, getting them prepackaged at Safeway. We don't have a natural understanding about the reality of life. So art exists within a controlled, a controlled space. BAP sort of alludes to this about the manufactured artificial subcultures that exist within controlled space. Within a controlled environment, art is always going to be sort of this abstraction of reality because reality is war. Reality is struggle. Reality is pain. So all this art, which does not exist in that reality, is going to give this false worldview to people. So that's why, though I personally think rap is a lower form of art, though I enjoy listening to it sometimes, it, it still is, is quite good in a sense because it is born out of the reality of life. These people who become rappers, they are living real life. Real life is chaos and barbarism and death, and they see that. And I think that's why a lot of suburbia likes rap because it feels real, whereas our Taylor Swift music doesn't feel real. And this is, and I'm going to bring up EDM later as like this sort of golden mean, this golden rule and the future. But this is why people like rap because it, it is born out of the reality of life. The only problem is, like I said, there is no 
Apollonian to the Dionysian, so to speak. There is no order to this violence. It's just this orgiastic violence, which is very harmful, which is why rap is a lower art form. But out of war, and I think this could be the reality, you have to have mass, you have to have the masses re-antiquated with nature, which means chaos, which means tragedy. Warfare traditionally has been that thing. And I think naturally when people grow decadent, of course, they eventually, their final fall comes through warfare. So of course, this is true of the Romans. This is true of many great empires throughout history. So maybe for the United States, it's war with China. And I don't even think we're going to lose a war with China. But like the price of victory could be so bad that people actually see, holy shit, Life is warfare. Life is bloodshed. Life is chaos. And they're re, they're real. They're they're waken, woken up. They take the red pill, and then maybe that allows them to return to this vitalistic art, to this cultural renaissance, which is like real life, which is a life that is antiquated alongside nature. But on the flip side, what you sort of said with we we have to if if we actually act to to create a cultural renaissance without this collapse, so I guess more orchestrated and unorganic, then that's that's a much more difficult thing. And I think that requires cunning, and it requires getting playing the game, so to speak, playing the game to get into positions of power. So I know there's been a lot of talk, a lot of uh, criticism on the dissident right about J.D. Vance, but uh, I think it's... I think it's a little bit too harsh because J.D. Vance could just be playing the game. He could just be playing the game and maybe he has the actual will to do what needs to be done in the long term. And I say this because he follows Rog Nationalists and he follows BAP, right? So who knows? Maybe he actually gets it, but he's just playing the game. So he says stupid shit once in a while. But uh, I don't know. But I think that overall, if we want to do this organically, we kind of have to play the game. We kind of have to... to work within the framework we have to work within the system and that's much more difficult than building from the ashes but regardless in either of those two circumstances i think that what we can do people like you and i arc and like the legionaries listening and uh like your your vitalist people is that you can prepare yourself for when the time comes and this of course is the concept with evola and ride the tiger to ride the tiger you're essentially saying well the conditions right now are not yet ready that I can actually act. I need to wait for the right moment to strike, but I'm going to ride the tiger. I'm going to get myself to be the highest spiritual quality I can be, the strongest physically I can be. So when the time comes, I'm ready to take advantage of it. So that's one thing I think the bare minimum that everybody in this greater sphere can do is prepare yourself mentally and physically. But beyond that, there is organically, we might have to rebuild from the ashes. Or we have to play the long game and insert ourselves within the system, play the game, not be psycho weirdos like all these incels and other freaks online who are like never going to get anywhere because they just, they just, they're freaks, right? You have to play the game. You have to be polite. You have to work within the system. You can't just appear like this QAnon weirdo. So that, that's sort of my view on what, what you said is that there's, there's two different paths, right? But ultimately... Cultural renaissance will only come uh, intentionally because organically, sure, but like intentionally you still have to try even if you are waiting for that organic opportunity and intentionally we have to reintroduce the youth especially to these concepts. The Iliad should be taught in every school. These vitalist and heroic elements of myth need to be retaught in school and we're not so, we weren't so far off from that. Not too long ago, even 50, 60 years ago, kids were still being brought up on stories of heroism in World War II. That's a sort of myth of its own because you're, you're, you're invoking this heroic sentiment within the American character to like, I want to be like these heroes who storm the beaches of Normandy. But that's completely gone today. You know who the heroes are? And I've said this before, and it's, it's a terrible thing. The biggest hero I was taught of when I was growing up was MLK. And... This might piss a lot of people off, but I don't think he's a good person to teach to be a hero for kids. Why would you want your hero to just be a civil rights activist? That's essentially putting yourself in the shoes of somebody who is, is uh, let's say, in the position of the spiritual slave. That's who kids are taught to see as a hero. Taught to see as, uh, someone as a hero who is weak, 
in terms of actual power and who has to subvert and manipulate the system through sympathy to be able to rise up. That should not be our hero. People like MLK shouldn't be the heroes that are, are brought up in school. They should, our heroes should be the, the Theodore Roosevelt's who stormed Spanish lines in Cuba and won the Medal of Honor. Our heroes should be the, the young men, literally our age or younger even, who stormed the beaches of Normandy, who stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima. These should be our heroes, the people who really made America stronger and greater. So long as our heroes are people who actually worked against the system and who only were successful through the slaves' will to power, then that's what you're going to tell everybody else in this country to be like. So it goes from art all the way to education, but it all combines. So that art today, so much, so much of it is like, look at like, uh, who uh, was it? Who is America? Was that song by a Childish Gambino where he's like, um, this is America. How the hell are we allowing this garbage into the ears of everybody? You want to teach our, our youth and the people about how terrible this country is and how we should... We should actually combat it. It's just ridiculous. So the art is all subversive towards actually trying to make this country stronger, more powerful, and of a higher human type. I went a bit uh, on a bit of another rant there, Ark. So I'll, I'll pass it back to you. But uh, yeah. Well, hold on. Taylor is calling. <laughs> yes, hello? Yes, okay, okay. So uh, Taylor says to, to return to the first po portion of what you were saying uh, she says that there perhaps could be a third way besides collapse and uh, besides the long march through the institutions both of which are uh, i guess the first being likely and the second being a viable option but i think or rather a uh, uh, taylor taylor says sorry uh, that there is <laughs> there is a third way <laughs> which is if you look at history and times when there has been a decadent society and there has been a revival of sorts or a change of direction, at least, we could again take the example of Rome, which we harp on a lot. We have, you know, the origin of, of Rome with the Republic, a still vital people connected with life. We have the uh, transition to the empire, which would look, you know, like institutional change, right? like uh, Baron Trump, for example, uh, somehow changes the, the United States government and, and perhaps implements new policies and, you know, revives the, the country from decadence or something like that. But we also have the example of something like Christianity. Now, that might not be the best example because Christianity was opposed to Rome in many ways and, uh, you know, in many ways subverted and, and destroyed Rome. Uh, I don't think that was the sole cause of their collapse, but if you just look at the idea of Christianity in general, it's not necessarily institutional capture. Uh, it's not necessarily collapse, but it's the birth of a new ideology and a new identity. And Christianity, of course, isn't the only example. You have, you know, different things like the cult of Mithras and so on and many different movements throughout history. But another effective way to enact change is the birth of a new identity, the birth of a new ide ideology, because what that does, as we were talking about earlier, is it connects the individual to this broader worldview. So right now, I think it's very hard for people in our sphere to kind of come into our sphere in the first place, because to get here... You have to go through so many different things. You know, you have to stumble upon one of our videos. You have to read Nietzsche, and there's all these foreign concepts, all these foreign ideas, and so on. And it's very hard to get to a point where you really feel that what you are and what you identify with is defined. Even I, you know, when someone asks me like, "What's your political views or whatever?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm. I, I don't know, man. You don't want to hear about it." Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Whereas when you <laughs> when you have other ideologies or religions like Christianity or you know, being a Republican or a Democrat, someone can just identify with these things and therefore join the movement. Mm -hmm. And you can have a Republican or, or a Democrat who knows you know, nothing about any political ideology. It's just an identity for them, but it's still effective in bringing them into a certain social movement, right? And so I think that could be another way forward. Of course, we'd want something that was a bit more 
uh, specific and targeted than republicanism or uh, you know liberalism or Christianity. But if there was some kind of movement which formed, I'm not sure what it would be called, you know, that especially young people could identify with and engage with, uh, then that could be extremely powerful. And something like that, I think, could take a country, even the world by storm, and very quickly bulldoze even things like establishment political parties, if it has enough energy, if it's easy for people to identify with, if it's compelling, if it channels their energy, if it does all the things that we've been talking about that a, a mythos, a worldview should do. Yeah. And there's two things that I would like to draw from the, from what you said. And I think that the first, the first uh, hump that we might encounter with something like that is trying to because fundamentally what we have is more or less an aristocratic worldview it's more or less a the the worldview of the master and most people operate with a slave mindset whether we like it or not so the issue becomes how do you convince those with a slave mindset which are the majority to follow something which is in in, in opposition to their general character and the question is is that possible and I think it is possible. It's just a very difficult undertaking. And then you ask yourself, well, how do we do it? Because you mentioned our niche is very difficult to come by. You either have to come by a video. And let's say you come by a video, but you've never read Nietzsche before. It might be very confusing or you might feel lost. And I think that in regards to that, what we have to do, you and I and everybody else, is find ways to disseminate these, these ideas in a more palatable form. And I think that books, music, film, fashion, even what we're doing now, just making videos, this is exactly what we need to do. You need to distill the overall spirit into a very consumable way without diluting the message, but just making it, conducing it, or con, uh, yeah, con, conducing, I don't know if that's the right word, into a form that is more consumable, not at the expense of the spirit of what we're trying to disseminate, but just in a a smaller form. So music, for example, I think music is an excellent way to impart this this more aristocratic feeling. And that's why I think EDM is the future of the aristocratic movement. And the reason why is because I think it there, first of all, there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of uh, actual form to it. So of course, Nietzsche sometimes points to, he points to the orchestra being superior to to music with with lyrics because the unbridled form of just pure music sometimes is more powerful and of course EDM has very if it has any lyrics is very limited and it's more about the beat and it's more about the the actual instrumental value but even with the lyrics of EDM it's all very much upgoing it's not sad it's always you know party it's always l affirming life and, and feeling vital. And that's why I think EDM is the future because it is an aristocratic type of music which everybody likes. Everybody likes EDM. And I think if more people listen to EDM, you would actually see a shift in the psychology of these people because EDM is, is a life-affirming form of music. And I think it's something that can replace something like rap, which does have vitalistic elements, but, or, but or it's oriented from a negative and orgiastic view of violence, which is not controlled, whereas EDM... You can feel violent in a way, but it's always this positive kind of virile violence. Not like I'm going to go murder somebody. It's more like I'm going to go to the gym. That's kind of violent in a way. Or I'm going to go do my MMA fight. It, it, it's positive. It's a positive vision. And with film, you have to create films which, again, invoke this positive, vitalistic, high vril spirit within you. You have to find all these forms of media and you have to put your ideas into them because it's a lot easier for someone to listen to a song and then feel a certain way and then explore that feeling than locking them in a room and saying, you're going to read Beyond Good and Evil, Ge Genealogy of Morals, uh, Twilight of the Idols, <laughs> Birth of Tragedy. You're going to read all of Nietzsche's books and until you're done reading, I'm going to keep you locked in here. Uh, so while that's effective for, for the... Uh, the Russian e-girls that uh, we've procured from from the East. Uh, it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. I wouldn't do that. Um, it's not necessarily effective for 
a wider the wider masses but i think putting our message into music into film into books more palatable means is the future you have to create new art and i mean this is the whole point of this conversation right how do we do a cultural renaissance cultural renaissance is art essentially and art what it should be art should be the bridge between nature and civilization it should be what connects civilization to nature and what is nature but not war and what is beauty but not the aesthetic of war as i've said many times in my videos the greek aesthetic of beauty is always tied to warfare these great strong lean bodies which are used to defeat your enemies in battle beauty is the armor of of warfare and violence but in control of apollonian substance in a sense and the same thing for art art is the bridge between what is good in nature and civilization. So we have to create new art. We have to create vibrant art that act, people actually enjoy and that can reinvigorate the spirit. And that's kind of kind of sort of going to be where I close off and my final thoughts. But I do want to give you a chance. Uh, what final thoughts you have, Ark, regarding this topic and uh, just the general zeitgeist of of what we're exploring here. Well, I think you're absolutely correct, and therefore the only real solution to modernity can be, as I mentioned before, giant Taylor Swift statues with the torch of Prometheus. <laughs> but I like I like your addition, which is that they will be blasting EDM music 24-7, and uh, there actually will be no sleeping in this country until nice. we have a, a classical-style renaissance, and people are just dancing in the street after having not slept for days on end and give themselves over to the spirit of Dionysus, start to tear down all the modern art, all the modern buildings. <laughs> and uh, there will only be, you know, as Nietzsche says, all gods are dead. Uh, and now we want uh, the new gods, the the Ubermensch to live. But in this case, there will only remain uh, one new god, which will be the Promethean uh, Taylor Swift. But yes, I, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think the effects of culture, yeah, definitely cannot be underestimated and if you could really base your movement on life on vitality on on beauty on these things which we inherently value uh, because you know the goal after all is to achieve these things and to re-imbue our society with these things it it does naturally attract people um, you know beauty vitality these things do naturally attract people and if you can as you say uh, consolidate them in a more digestible message, things like music, things like media, so that they don't have to read, uh, you know, Nietzsche's entire work, uh, then that can be very effective for winning people over. And, you know, again, as I said before, I mean, how many Christians have even read the whole Bible? How many Christians, you know, really have read, if they have read the Bible, any actual Christian uh, writings or, or theology or anything like that, right? They, they, this grand tradition is there and it's enough for them just to connect with it, you know, superficially or, or uh, not, as, not even necessarily superficially, but they don't need to, you know, know everything about this tradition. So it's kind of the responsibility of people like us to uh, build all this, you know, schizophrenic uh, background stuff, <laughs> Nietzschean philosophy, understand how it connects to history, the goals and all of that. But, you know, the average person, if there were to be a movement which embodies all this, doesn't need to understand all of that. They just need, you know, one point of, of connection with it. They just need to enter, identify with this spirit of vitality and rebirth. Based, and I agree completely. Uh, thanks for coming on, as usual. And uh, I wish you an auspicious journey back to Mars. I would like you to give my best and warmest regards to the Queen, Taylor Swift, may the milk from her breasts born a new <laughs> Romulus. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, dude, uh, thanks for thanks for coming on. Always a pleasure to speak with you. And for all the legionaries out there, or all the 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 prospective seers, or just normies who feel an inkling towards the schizophrenic esoteric message. Uh, I wish you a good day and continue on the path. Listen to EDM, go to the club and dance like a uh, Dionysian cultist and you will start to in embark on a journey of real. Oh, also, don't forget to lift and drink, drink raw breast milk for the best protein 
gains. <laughs> so I approve this message and thank you for having me on. Of course. And also, as always, this is the Warrior Philosopher building the foundations of the Warrior Philosophy. We'll see you next time. Salwete, Legionaries. You can now support the channel both on Patreon and on Ko-Fi. Patreon has a monthly subscription where you have access to exclusive content, community, one-on-one -on -one calls with me, as well as shout-outs at the end of every video, while Ko-Fi is more for one-time donations to show your support for the work I do. And speaking of shout-outs, we have our first supporter on Patreon, Rosendo Mayorga. Thank you so much for contributing to the Patreon, and a special shout out to you. But as always, Legionaries, keep supporting the work we do here, keep training on your own, and prepare yourself for the coming of new Rome. Ave Caesar.